we can we can turn to the book of Romans chapter four. I'll pray for me. I'm using a new Bible and not even the same type of Bible for a publisher, so it might be a little difficult to find a way around this morning. So we're gonna go Romans chapter four, verse number sixteen and seventeen. We'll look at Lord will today. That's gonna make a little side note before we begin. If you recall, we were studying through the beginning of this book and as well as looking at the life of Paul that Claudius had banned the Jews from Rome during his reign. And that's why Paul was able to meet Aquila and Priscilla in Corinth because they right. had to leave Rome. But apparently by this time that he wrote the book of Romans, I, don't know, I think Claudius had already died or the reign had been taken over by somebody else. And at the very least, that, that edict must have expired because there were Jews back in Rome, as he addresses them several times in the letter. And we'll see when we get to the end of the book, Will and Priscilla are there in Rome again at this point. So. Right. So there is a, a mixed congregation here that he's talking to. As we see, as we have saw, he calls Abraham the father of us all, both Jews and Gentiles. Mm -hmm. We'll address that here in our lesson today. But previously, we've seen how Abraham had his faith counted for righteousness. It was about 24 years before his circumcision, and around 430 years before the law was given. So, works were not a part of his quote salvation. Amen. And we we see how that we have received the the promise to be heirs of the world, just like Abraham received that promise, because it's to Abraham and his seed, which is Christ. Mm -hmm. And through faith in Christ, we have claim to this spiritual inheritance, if you will. And that promise was not and cannot be the law because it had to be by faith. And we'll pick up there in verse 16. He's on the same thought here. He says, Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to end the promise might be sure to all the seed, and not to that only which is of the law, but to that also, which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God whom quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Amen. So here he says, therefore, at the beginning of our text, therefore, because what we saw in the previous verses, that the law worketh wrath, because faith will be made void, and promise made none effect, those that were of the law were made heirs. He says, therefore, because of these things, he says, it is of faith that it might be by grace. Mm -hmm. this, this inheritance we have through Christ, which you know, ultimately is everlasting life, but it spreads to other things as well. Amen. That comes to us through the means of faith and by God's grace. So it was with Abraham, and so it is today. You know, that reminds me of Ephesians 2 8, doesn't it? For by grace are you saved through faith. Yeah. Yeah. See, the example has really not changed. I mean, yes, there are things that are different from Abraham's time to our time, but it's still through faith and by grace that we are saved. Amen. It has never been of works that one of obtain salvation or that one obtains the promises of God. Now certainly God did give conditional promises at times that if you do this then I will do that. But when it comes to salvation it is always or since Abraham example it has always been by faith and by grace. Amen. Well, faith is required on our part but really even the fact that we have faith is a gift of God. Okay. What does the next part of Ephesians 2 say? That, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not yourselves it is the gift of God. Amen. And our works, any man should boast. Yeah. That we can only have the saving faith, that really, if, because it's a gift of God. Because it's by His own grace, He grants it. Second Thessalonians 3 2, and I'll turn there, but it tells us that for all men have not faith. The man, actually speaking, does not have faith. 
the natural man is in the flesh and cannot please God. He says later in the book of Romans, yet God is pleased by his grace to grant faith to us. And therefore we can say salvation is of the Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. you know, works are produced of our own hands, but faith is the gift of God. And that is, I think, what Paul is driving home here in our text, that if those that were of the law were heirs, then it would be a, a works-based promise. But it's fully of his grace. And he says here that to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed, as if it was based on our obedience, we could fall short of the mark, couldn't we? Right. If it was based on the keeping of the law, then all of us would fall short of that which was required. So if the promise here given was conditioned upon our works or upon keeping the law, it would not be a very sure thing. I said each and every one of us, including the Jews back in this time, they all fell short of keeping the law perfectly. Right. And we know that Abraham, he was before the law was. Mm -hmm. And it was before even the circumcision that we saw that he had faith in God and was counted for him for righteousness. So it is the same today that's not of the keeping of the law, it's not of doing good works that this promise is made, but it's this promise of what's sometimes called messianic inheritance or our inheritance through Christ. That is conditioned solely upon the grace of God, not our own doing. Amen. But because it is of the grace of God, it is a very sure thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's something you can depend upon because it is God who gives it solely of his own goodness. And it can be a, a sure and confident promise that we have that we will receive this promise because it is given to us of his grace and not because of our own doing. We can be sure that it will be fulfilled all of his seed, as he calls it here, all those that belong to Christ. If you remember when we looked at Galatians 3, that if we are Christ, then we are of Abraham's seed. That's it. And we know this is not in a, a physical sense, but it does include some of the physical seed of Abraham as well as us, the Gentiles, as he says in the next part of the here. Not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham. You know, when it comes to this inheritance we have in Christ, our works cannot earn it, and but neither can our disobedience void it. And that ought to be a, a reassuring promise for us as a people of God. That, Amen. That not only does God give it freely, he also doesn't take it away because of our disobedience. And there are many today that teach that type of thing, though, don't they? Well, they have salvations of grace, but you've got to hold out faithful or you're not going to be saved in the end. Mm -hmm. and I do believe God's people will serve Him or they will be chastised, but our salvation, our justification, this spiritual inheritance that He's referring to now. None of that is based upon our own faithfulness, but simply by the, the grace of God and through the means of faith. He says here, not to them only which are of the law, but also them which are the, is of the faith of Abraham. And it's not to just the Jews only which had the law, but it's to all those who would believe in Christ, mm -hmm. all those who would have faith in God like Abraham had. So the Jews, they had many advantages, didn't they? In, in one sense, they had been committed to oracles of God. We saw earlier in the book here, Romans, and they had been given the law and the prophets and so many other things, and yet salvation is not solely for the Jew, but it's for all them that believe. That's right. We see examples of that in the Old Testament, <clears throat> such as Ruth and Rahab, and even the people of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah. 
And then in the New Testament, we see the turning of God towards the Gentile nations. Amen. Really, the Jews were a very blessed people in the Old Testament, but and they are really still people of God in a physical sense today. And we have this blessing of Abraham, as it's called, this, this promise, this covenant that was given to Abraham was extended to us as the Gentiles as well. It's upon, it's unto and upon all those that believe. And it says not for just those that were of the law, but all those that believe, for all those who have the faith of Abraham. Mm -hmm. Who is, and he says, the father of us all. And I said this is not in the natural sense as the Jews often bragged about. They, they would say, we have Abraham as our father. Mm -hmm. They put a lot of stock in that Abraham was their physical father, but that he descended from him. But they weren't the only ones who descended from Abraham. Right. Yet, just being a descendant of Abraham did not make them heir to this promise. Just because they were a Jew did not make them, quote, saved. Right. No, he is the father to, of all them that believe. Well, there are many uh, people today that do the exact same thing that Jews though, did, though, don't they? They say, well, my grandfather was a pastor, therefore I'm okay. Or mm -hmm. my, my dad was this, or my mother was this, or you know, they trust in everything except for God. Right. So we are to have the same faith that Abraham had. And in that sense, he is the father of us all. Which that led me to two two questions. Why Abraham and what about the others before Abraham? Well, I think the main reason we are given Abraham as an example is because this is actually the first first time mentioned in scriptures that one believed in God is with Abraham. Genesis 15, 6, and he believed in the Lord and was counted unto him for righteousness. Amen. You don't see anyone mentioned before that, that, that he believed in God. Now we know that Abel had faith. We know that Enoch had faith and Noah had faith. Hebrews 11 records that for us. But yet we're told of Abraham, he believed in the Lord. <laughs> you don't see any other mention of that or faith before then. Well, I think that is one of the main reasons why Paul uses Abraham as our example because just as Abraham believed in the Lord and is counted on him, it was counted on him for righteousness, so it is for us today. Amen. We have faith in Christ and the righteousness of Christ is imparted to us. But Abraham was nobody special. You know, he did not have some superpowers or something. Right. That in himself that attracted God to him. If you remember the life of Abraham, or Abram before he was called out of God, he was still worshiping the pagan gods of his ancestors over the land of Chaldee. He was not seeking after God. He was yet God came to him and said, It is I who brought the out of land or the Chaldees. And then he gives him the promise that he would be the father of many nations. Through his seed would be as a multitude of sand, or a multitude of stars, and as the sand of the sea. Really, it was only by God's good pleasure and grace that Abraham was chosen, and really so it is with us today. You ought to not look down and see anything remarkable within us. There was nothing that was really worthy or even attractive in us. As we'll see in chapter 5, we were sinners in the sight of God. Amen. We were anything but desirable to a holy and righteous God, but yet by His love and His own good pleasure, His grace and His mercy, He bestows these things upon us. And because it's fully dependent upon God, not upon us, and we can be sure that the promise will come to pass. 
that's what Paul brings out here in our next verse, verse 17. He goes on to say, as it is written, that is in Genesis 17, verse 5, that he will quote from here. He says, I have made thee a father of many nations. And this is the promise he was given. He said, when his name was changed from Abraham to Abraham, he says, I have made thee a father of many nations. That's both in a natural sense and in a spiritual sense. We know that from Ishmael and Isaac became nations. And from all those children he had from Keturah, they all became nations. Right. Even Isaac's seed, both Jacob and Esau, they both in their own self became nations. Right. But as Abraham became the father of many nations, naturally speaking, the Muslims, they claim their lineage through Abraham, through Ishmael, at least those who were of the Middle Eastern descent. They say Muhammad came through Ishmael. Mm -hmm. Yes, Abraham had many descendants, and many that can proclaim that they are of his seed, naturally, right. but he also became the father of many nations in a spiritual sense, and that through Christ, all the nations of the world were blessed. In right. Christ, all the nations of the world have believed. <laughs> yeah. We, I don't know the, the extent of how far the gospel has reached, but I know it's reached all the ends of the earth. I know that, that when God said that in the shall all nations of the earth be blessed, that was a foreshadowing of Christ and the gospel. Amen. In that sense, all the nations of the earth have been blessed. And in that sense, he is the father of many nations. Because in every nation, kindred, and tongue, there has been someone that has been born again, someone who has heard the gospel and believed. So then he is called our father here, which is the father of us all. That is because he is, in that spiritual sense, the same way we, that he believed, we believe today. He is our example. He is, as far as I can see in the scriptures, he was the first of this type of salvation to believe in God. It was counted for him for righteousness. Amen. And so he is our example to follow today, to believe in God, and it shall be counted unto us for righteousness. So the Jews had a problem with that. I don't know how they, they missed the mark other than the fact that they were spiritually blind. But they, they saw Abraham as their father. They proudly proclaimed Abraham as their father. They, they saw in the scriptures how they believed God was counted for righteousness, and yet they still trusted in their own righteousness. Mm -hmm. They trust in their keeping of the law and how that they were as Paul said, blameless as touching the law. And they had a great zeal of God but it was not according to knowledge. They had a lot to boast about but yet they couldn't even simple, follow the simple example Abraham had just to simply believe in God. Right. Here he says after he adds this parenthetical statement about how that Abraham was a father of many nations. He's referring back to Abraham again. He says, before him, whom he believed, even God. And there are many types and likenesses that we see in scriptures of how Abraham was like God the Father and how Isaac was as Christ, the only begotten, the promised son, we had Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. None of them were, were ever meant to be worshipped. Right. None of them were ever meant to be, quote, venerated, as the Roman Catholics call it. Exactly. That's really just worship in a different form. You're right. But though he is in many ways the type of God the Father, he is, we still see here that his object of his faith was God. And so it is for us today, the object of our faith is always to be God, isn't it? 
It's not to be Hope the Church. It's not to be our own works. It's not to even be Brother Larry or even worse, the priest or the Pope. Right? Our faith will never be in man or our own doings, but rather the object of our faith is always to be God, whether it be whether we're referring to God the Father, or God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, or our faith is always to be in God. And yet there's so many that miss that today too, it seems like. Mm -hmm. They put their faith in their good works and they'll, when they get up there to heaven, God's going to look at the list and let them in. That's really, there's really no faith in that, is there? There's no saving faith in that, that's for sure. Amen. The Catholics, they put a lot of faith in Mary and that she's going to do something for them. Sorry to say, Mary is up there around the throne worshiping God just like the rest of the saints. Mm -hmm. She's not interceding on our behalf. She's You're right. mediating on our behalf. She is not co redemptrix with Christ. But neither is Abraham up there doing anything for the Jews either. He is, I'd say he is around the throne worshiping God just like the rest of the saints. If God is not the object of our faith and our faith is misplaced, so we, we could put a lot of confidence in man, but man will always let you down. The scripture make that very clear. Back that. We certainly should be able to, I don't know what the word would be, we should be able to have some trust in our brothers and sisters in Christ and, and the church, generally speaking, but that should not be the object of our faith. When all else fails, we should always trust God first and foremost. Amen. No, and he goes on to say of God, he says, Who quickeneth the dead? Only God can truly make the dead to live again, both physically and spiritually. Amen. We do see some instances where God bestows the power of raising the dead upon men, such as Elijah and Elisha and Paul, I'd say even, even those powers were only because they had faith in God. It wasn't that they had some supernatural power like a superhero and they could just walk over and raise the dead as they wished. But Elijah, it says that he was a man like a, subject to passions like as we are. In that, Elijah, he was, yet he has, a very fervent man when he came to prayer. He had much faith in God. I would say Elisha followed that same example. Paul as well. But we only we see that only God has ever raised one from the dead spiritually. Amen. The disciples, apostles, none of them ever raised anyone from the dead in that sense. Well, they did a lot of miracles, they did a lot of healings, and they cast out devils even at times, but yet the giving of spiritual life only comes from God through Christ. Turn over to John chapter 5, we'll see this. John chapter 5, verse 21. Hear Christ speaking, he says, For as the Father raises up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. He that that God is the one who has power over death, both physically and spiritually. That it is the Son, that is Christ, who says he quickens whom he will. That whomsoever he desires, he will make alive spiritually. And so every desire he made alive physically too, didn't he? Amen. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He raised the, the widow woman's son from the dead. And at his own resurrection, all the, it says the bodies of the saints arose. And in Ephesians 2, verses 1, it tells us that, and you who were dead in trespasses and sins, or you have to quicken who were dead in trespasses and sins. And then he repeats that same thing in verse 5. But hey, Pat, God, who was rich in mercy and love toward us, and he 
quicken us while we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And spiritually, we were all dead until God gave us life. Just as physically, Lazarus was dead until Christ called him from the grave. Amen. All the other examples we have. None of those dead men called out for to be raised from the dead, but yet God raised whom he will. And so it is spiritually, God raises whom he will according to his own good pleasure. We were dead in trespasses and sins. We were dead without any life to call upon him, and yet he says, we said one day, the Larry come forth, or the Junior come forth, Sister Donna came forth. In the same way the Lazarus came out of the grave physically, we come out of that grave spiritually. Amen. And Abraham had faith that God was able to do this even back in his day. And it says when he went to offer Isaac that he believed that God could raise him back from the dead again. And he says, after he says, in him whom he quickeneth, or to, before him whom he believed in, God who quickeneth the dead, and he says, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. You know, in this distance here, we see that Abraham was an old man without any children of his own. And yet God called him a father of many nations. Amen. Man, logic would say, well, how is that possible? Sarah was long past the, the age of fertility. Abraham was probably not exactly in his physical prime either. Right. And yet God can call those things which are not as though they were, it says. When God decrees something, you can sure it's as good as done already. Amen. It's a sure thing to come to pass. That is why we can take great confidence in the promises of God that are based upon His grace and His goodness. That is why we can take great confidence in when He says, This is going to happen, it's going to happen. Amen. And this is the way it's going to be, and that's the way it's going to be. Going indirectly and calling Abraham a father of many nations, he also calls us a people which were not a people. Mm -hmm. He calls us his people which were not his people. We will, we'll see that later on in the book of Romans. But over in Hosea, he prophesied that God will one day call people his people which were not his people, and that's us as the Gentiles. Well, there are some who say that when Abraham was said to be a father of many nations, and the ten tribes they were scattered, and they became their nation, and that's where we came from. I don't see that in the scriptures. All I know is that if we believe in Christ, we are of Abraham's seed spiritually. If we have the same type of faith that Abraham had, then we are. Heirs of the same promise that Abraham had to be heir of the world, to be heir of everlasting life. You can be sure God can make things be which are not. Amen. John believed the same thing, didn't John the Baptist? And the Jews came to him and forget exactly the full context of the scripture there, but he's they of course went again and said, We we have Abraham as our father. What did he say? God was able to raise up these stones, children of Abraham. Amen. God is able to really do the impossible with things that we would deem unworthy, unusable. Let's go over to Isaiah chapter 46 and we'll draw this to a close. Isaiah 46, verses 9 through 11.
hear God speaking through the prophet Isaiah. He says, remember this, or excuse me, remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things which or that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, I will do all my pleasure. Amen. Calling the ravenous bird from the east, and the man that excuse my counsel from a far country, he has spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. So we can be sure that when God declares something, it's going to happen. He knows the end from the beginning, as he says here. Amen. In fact, he's declared the end from the beginning. But the things that were done thousands of years ago, he's declared those things. Well, the things that will happen far into the future. Mm -hmm. Saying, my counsel shall stand, I will do all my pleasure. Nebuchadnezzar learned that the hard way, didn't he? Right. He had to spend years living as a wild animal before he came to the realization that None can stay his hand or stand to him, what do us though? Well, as he says in the end of our verse 11 there, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass, I have purposed it, I will also do it. See, when God speaks, it's going to happen. You can be sure about it. And he's, well, I don't know how it's all going to play out in our lives and in the future, but yet. I know in the end, Christ is going to return and he's going to destroy all the enemies, all those that obey not the gospel. He's going to, to bring about a great white throne and cast all those that are unbelievers into the lake of fire. Amen. So, though the devil may seem to have the upper hand at times, we know that God is still in control and his purpose will always come to pass. And we can be sure, even though we sometimes fail and are disobedient, and are not always the faithful servant that we ought to be. That when God has promised something to us, it is going to come to pass as well. Mm -hmm. When God said, I shall lose none that thou givest me, Christ said that, and you can be sure that Christ is going to lose none that are his. He said he shall save his people from their sins, and you can be sure that Christ is going to save his people from their sins. Mm -hmm. We can have great confidence that God is going to bring to pass all that he has said he will do. All that he has declared will happen, all that he has promised that he will do for us. Because our God is the Almighty, he is the, the omnipotent one, if you will. Amen. He is above all the gods of this world he is greater than any inventions of man or he is greater than satan who is just a simple creature himself and though the whole world may be against us we can say if god be for us who can be against us there you go that ought to give us great confidence as people of god that we can rely upon our God. He is sure and steadfast, if you will. Every promise of His is something we can count on. It's not as a promise of a man. That even when physical barriers seem to make it impossible, or even when the world of the opposition seems to make it impossible, yet God will reign fast. Amen. I've been listening a couple times to that song that Brother Junior used to sing, God Delivers Again. And he mm -hmm. certainly always does, despite of what seems like an impossible circumstance to man. That's it. Amen. Abraham had that same type of faith in God, and he should as well today. That when God says he will do something, when he promises something will come to pass, we can have the utmost confidence that it will come to pass because mm -hmm. our God is the Almighty Jehovah. He is outside the constraints of time and physical laws, and He is not bound by the things, same, same things man is bound by. You're right. Yet He is true and faithful, and He cannot lie. 
Therefore, what he has said he will do, he will most certainly do. And we can have great faith and confidence in that. And just the same if you're lost. He said, if you believe on him, you shall have everlasting life. And that's just as sure a promise as anything else. Let's close with that thought. Amen. Amen.